I was super privileged to talk to Professor Brian Toon, who is one of the original five authors of the nuclear winter theory. And the, that theory was developed in, was published in 19, in the early 1980s. One of Professor Toon's professors was Carl Sagan, who is sort of the most famous author of the nuclear winter theory. And, you know, there were all kinds of controversies about it when it came out, including the Defense Department saying it was Soviet propaganda, which it wasn't. And what the nuclear winter author authors conceded back in the 80s was that their modeling was just the best it could be based on what they had at the time. And so now flash forward to where we are in 2024 and talking to Professor Toon, who's been working on this issue for all these decades since, he shared with me how the climate models today with the systems we have, the computer systems, reveal that actually nuclear winter is worse, right? So to answer your questions, the bombs stop falling, in my scenario, 72 minutes after they first launch. The bombs stop falling. And then the mega fires begin. Each nuclear weapon will have, according to the Defense Department, a mega fire that will burn between 100 and 300 square miles. So 1,000 weapons, 1,500 weapons, think about those mega fires. Everything is burning, forests, cities. Py think about the pyrotoxins in all the cities, you know, high rises burning. And all of this soot gets lo lofted into the air. According to Tune, some 300 billion pounds of soot. And what happens? It blocks out the sun. And without sun, we have nuclear winter. We have a situation whereby ice sheets form. You're talking about bodies of water in places like Iowa being frozen for 10 years. So temperature drops. Temperature plummets, right? And there are all kinds of papers that have been written about this using modern calculate, you know, systems. And the numbers vary, but the bottom line is agriculture fails. Mm -hmm. Food obviously uh, dies. Uh, so the agriculture system completely shuts down. So the food sources shut down. So there's no food, there's no sun, temperature drops completely, no electricity. And we haven't even spoken of radiation poisoning because, you know, the radiation poisoning kills many people in the aftermath of the nuclear, the nuclear exchange. But after the nuclear freeze ends, after nuclear winter, you know, if, after the sun starts to come back, let's say eight, nine, 10 years, um, now you have no ozone layer or you have a severely depleted ozone layer. And so the sun's rays are now poisonous. So you have people living underground and you have this great thawing. And with that great thawing comes pathogens and plague. And you have this, you know, system where the small bodied animals, the insects and whatnot begin reproducing really fast. And the larger body animals like you and me begin to go extinct. Professor Toon said it to me this way, you know, he said, 66 million years ago, an asteroid hit Earth, killed all the dinosaurs, and wiped out 70% of the species. And nuclear war would likely do the same. And so here we are talking about this because there is a difference. There's nothing you can do about an asteroid, but there is something you can do about a nuclear war. Do you think it's possible that some humans will survive all of this? So if we look... I mean, how long would it be? Uh, would it be decades? Would it be centuries before the you start to have the Earth starts to have the capacity to grow food again? Carl Sagan talked about that in his this amazing book that he wrote with two scientist colleagues called "The Cold and the Dark." And they and they have there's a bunch of essays about exactly this, right? Like how what would happen and how how long would it take? It's really interesting. It's dated, you know, it's from the 80s, but man, is it shocking. And you think about that, where okay, so men return to sort of the worst, most base versions of themselves. Civilization is gone, right? Meaning, you know, civil society. 
There's no rule of law. It's just fend for yourself. There's, you know, people fighting over what little resources there are. Man returns to a hunter-gatherer state. And to really think about this idea, I looked at uh, the oldest known archaeological site in the world, in Turkey, which is called Gobekli Tepe. And it's really fascinating to me because I interviewed one of the two archaeologists who first found this site in the early 90s. And the lead archaeologist was a, a guy named Klaus Schmidt, and Michael Morsch was the young graduate student who was with him. And Morsch's description of like coming upon this like rumored to be site, there was something called a wishing tree on the site, which I just found so human and perfect that it was this magical place and it was locatable because there was a wishing tree on a hill and it's where people went to wish and to hope that their wishes came true. I mean, how human is that, right? And that is where beneath the wishing tree, kind of like in the shadow of the wishing tree, there was a tep, which is a hill. Um, and beneath that, there is the oldest known civilization in the world. 12,000 years ago, a group of hunter-gatherers built this site. Why? We don't know. But I imagined when, through Morsh's descriptions of coming upon, like, you know, he tripped on a rock, he told me, right? He tripped over a stone that turned out to be the the top part of a 12,000-year-old sculpted man, giant pillar, right? And he talked about coming upon that. And then no one knows really what Gobekli Tepe was for. And that makes my mind try and answer your oh, the question you asked me internally, right? Just as like a human who's here on earth for the amount of time I'm here. Like if there were a nuclear war, what would it be like? What, what would it be like when someone in the future some ar- ar- would we become archaeologists one day? Would civilization rebuild? Would we develop computers? Who knows? It's interesting to think about. I hope we never have to. 